Inmates know that 60% of all prisoners re-offend. They accept that many prisons are far worse, but feel there is little incentive to reform, even though Long Latin has some basic facilities. Every inmate has a cell of his own. When you move in, you have a bed, table, chair, locker. That's it. Then you make of it whatever you can make of it, um, which is one good thing. At least you're allowed to do things with your cell. Uh, in most prisons, you can get nicked just for hanging a picture on the wall. The problem is that the public think that we live in luxury. Uh, at the end of the day, this is just a seven foot by eight foot concrete box. It's nothing more. The corridors are full of personal belongings. Despite a few reminders of home, inmates miss much. <sighs> well, you miss uh, relationships with people just being allowed to do the things that you want to do within reason. Um, simple things like just taking a walk whenever you feel like it, uh, without people watching all the time. Prison is my world and it's their world. And eventually we come to an accommodation with each other. They have to realize that I have to control the institution. I also have to realize that they've got to live in that institution. And in the end, at the end of the day, we've both got to live together. There is a degree of ambiguity in it. There is the problem of, at one extreme, maintaining the high level of security, but at the other, maintaining a very high level of humanity as well. In here, you've got no privacy. In here, everything is dictated by the system. In here, you're just a number. Um, you don't feel like a person in here. Outside, um, bears no relation at all to life inside prison. Um, people can't understand unless they're doing time. It's as simple as that. Uh, people can come into prison, they can look around it, but they know that they're going to walk out the gate again. It's different for prisoners. We don't get any days off. The mix of prisoners, murderers, robbers, rapists, terrorists, adds to the stress. So does the bitterness of those who insist on their innocence, like two of the Birmingham Six. It's very, very, very hard when you're in prison for something you haven't done. And also, when you wake up each morning and you say to yourself, well, what, well, what am I doing in here? Yeah. But if you were to think about it all the time, it just drag around the twist. You know what I mean? So you've you, you got to do things. No matter what it is, John goes to the gym. I do exceptional writing. I'm writing a book. More so when you're an innocent person, because even the guys that has, is convicted prisoners and have done the crime, they find it hard enough to do it. And they come, sometimes come to us and say, how in the name of God do these two guys do it? I lost my home in Birmingham, and my wife and my children had to flee the country, go and live in Ireland. Ireland to her is a foreign country. She'd never been in Ireland in her life before. So I get visits from my wife, say, twice a year. When I came into prison first, my youngest child was one year old. Now she's 16 years old. I never seen that girl grow up. I didn't see none of my children growing up. Security in all prisons was tightened last year after the dramatic escape by helicopter from Gartree Prison. Prisoners at Long Larton resent paying for this escape. Anti-helicopter devices were installed and the exercise area cut to a small space which could be protected from the air. Gartry didn't do us a lot of good and both myself and many of the, the inmates and the staff here wondered whether we would lose a great deal of our ethos, if you like. And for a period of time, we were on not terribly good ground. Um, you mean not terribly good terms with the inmates? No, we maintained that and were able to persuade the inmates that we would use the extra security devices that we have with a minimum of petty restrictions. We were unhappy about it because before we could exercise out on an open yard, now we exercise in a cage. Um, we've lost about two thirds of the playing field and we're just caged in all the time. So now there's no sense of freedom in here whatsoever. Despite extra restrictions, the prison authorities see the need to make prisons less isolated. 
John Bowden, an inmate at Long Larton, was convicted of a cruel murder. Yet he persuaded the prison governor to let him convene a unique forum where prisoners could speak out. On March 1st, 60 inmates made their way to the chapel. For the others, it was work as usual. Contradictions ruled. Prison routine remained sacrosanct, even though it was a big day when inmates could for once voice many of their concerns. At nine o'clock in the chapel, prisoners, prison staff, police, pressure groups and ex-convicts gathered. Many inmates came with prepared speeches and questions. The day-long forum had one absentee, John Bowden himself, who had been transferred out of Long Larton four weeks earlier as a punishment. For prisoners, the key topics were prison discipline, too many rules, too few rights, and dispersal to jails far from their homes. Inmates had to wait for guest speakers to argue both that the system had to give prisoners more rights and that they also had to take more responsibility. Reform is the other key word as far as today's proceedings are concerned. How may it be achieved? Which aspects of the system should be reformed? And who are to be the ultimate beneficiaries of any such reform as may be achieved? The governor interrupted the proceedings the moment he noticed the placard. Will be a little easier to visualize. Excuse me, can I just stop? Do you mind taking that down, please? What up on you, mate? I didn't even see it. The first speaker today is Stephen Shaw, who is a director of the, sorry, the director of the Prison Reform Trust, and presumably his address will be on the subject of reform, Mr. Shaw. Thank you very much. <laughs> It is obviously not every day that I receive a letter from a prisoner in one of our long-term maximum security institutions inviting me to take part in what that prisoner, John Bowden, rightly described as a unique discussion about the prison system. It must be said it's not every day that the Home Office agrees to such a debate taking place. On the other hand, we've also discovered that this is not a free debate. Uh, the prisoners' rights movement, PROP, uh, has been banned from taking part. Now, I think those two things illustrate the limits of openness and reconstruction, glasnost and perestroika within the penal system. Prisoners cannot expect to exert the influence they may wish to if they are divided amongst themselves. There are now 2,000 prisoners in the prison system on Rule 43, because they are not safe from other prisoners. That number of people in segregation uh, for their own protection has trebled, increased by a factor of three during the 1980s. Governors say to me um, that they're not going to take that much account of prisoners going on about their rights when they know, frankly, how little regard many prisoners pay to the rights of some of their fellows. Stephen Shaw ended by calling for a prison ombudsman to investigate prisoners' complaints. He was supported by Joe Sim, a sociologist from Liverpool. It seems to me that the prison system has to be much more accountable. I think there should be a strict um, introduction of rules and regulations laid down within the prisons themselves in terms of internal accountability so that prisoners know exactly what they're allowed, what they're due, what the prison officers can and cannot do, and removing a whole range of discretionary powers which um, prison officers, um, prison managers have at the moment. Men inside have never before heard former prisoner Jimmy Boyle explain how the Barlini Special Unit changed him. The inmates were eager to learn how the most dangerous man in Scotland had gone straight. In Scotland, Boyle is banned from visiting prison as if the authorities dislike his success. For the age of 11 to 38, at 12 and a half months outside, it was a revolving door syndrome that I felt myself caught up in. I felt frustrated, angry, I felt there was no way I could really get out of that. But now, there's a tremendous anger, embarrassment and humiliation 
about the part we do, prisoners play, in sustaining a system which is full of parasites that want to tell you what is the best way forward and what is best for you. Because that's what they are, parasites. They live off the back of you.